What happens when worlds collide? Well, you know, we want kids to be included in adult life. We want kids to be included in their lives, period. Okay? Now, yes, this is the autism world, but this could be any name here. It doesn't really matter. Okay? Because we have this person who has some label, and this person whose label is neurotypical. That's all. We just have different labels. Okay? Um, particularly with autism, one thing I will point out is that everything that happens here happens here, everything that happens here happens here, and that the person, by the way, just on this side of the line is really no different than the person on this side of the line. I mean, the spectrum really continues all the way over to here. Um, I firmly believe that you could go to any hobby convention <laughs> and 10% of the people there are diagnosable. 20% fall into that shadow syndrome thing. But they've all found their niche. They've all found their, you know, and one of the things I've always appreciated when uh, was AAMR, now it's AID, AIDD, um, yes. Um, when they redefined the diagnostic, cl the diagnostic classifications, they did say that if a person who was previously classified went on to have a job, to have friends, to have a life, that they should be no longer be considered as having the label, independent of IQ or other adaptive measures. I mean, I think the same goes for, should go for our group. You know, but we don't do that sort of thing. So um, it really is you know, critical that this, it, there, the differences are less than we might assume. But in the social realm, that's where the real challenges come in. Historically, we've said sort of that this is the person with autism. Our goal in educating you is to make you as neurotypical as possible. And that's all. Like, because I don't rock at Walmart, you can't rock at Walmart. And because I don't watch, you know, 20 seconds of this videotape over and over again, you can't watch 20 seconds of this videotape over and over again. Well, you know what? I don't rock at Walmart. That's true. I don't go to Walmart, but that's besides the point. <laughs> but like, I'm at the grocery store, and I'm like the fifth person in line with like. You know what I do? I read the star. That's my rocket. I'm bored. I don't know what else to do. If anybody comes along, I'm going to put it down. You know? So I'm kind of fascinated by like what Brittany's up to or Charlie Sheen right now. I'm fascinated, you know? <laughs> so that's my rocket. It's no, you know, and yeah, you know, I don't watch the same video, the same 20 seconds of videotape over and over again, but I download new songs to my iPod. And I listen to them over and over and over again until I'm tired of those songs and then I never listen to them again. Okay? It's the same thing. Okay? So we've set a weirdly inappropriate um, high standard that just wouldn't exist in, in any other world. Okay? For example, my friend Donna, who's on the spectrum, after she had a horrendous doctor visit, with a new gynecologist. And we had told her she really should disclose. You know, she has, she's on the spectrum and she's also quirky as all get out. So like, give him some information so he better understands you. Don't let him form his own opinions about you. She went, she said, by the way, you should not have Asperger's syndrome. He said, no, you don't. She said, yes, I do. He said, no, you don't. She said, yes, I do. He said, no, you don't. And she said, yes, I do, you stupid MF, SOB. Like, she like went off. <laughs> Went through a whole bunch of role play when she came back, and then the third role play, she turned to me and said, "You know what? If you neurotypicals have all the skills, why don't you adapt for a while? Damn it! Why is it always my fault?" She said, "If I was a wheelchair user, you wouldn't say, you know what? I'd love to hire you, but you got to learn to walk first." You know, and that's often what we do in the DD community. You know, we set these bars incredibly high. You know, and in the states and in Canada, we've gotten good culturally at understanding the needs of people with physical disabilities. How we can accommodate people. You know, we have handicapped parking stalls and we have ramps and we have all this sort of stuff. But nobody's bothered to inform the community what accommodations are for someone who has a developmental disability. How you can interact with that person. How you can support that person. Which is where we need to go next. If you think of any skill set that you go from not having it to having it as 100%, okay? If my students have 40% of the skill set, I have two options. I can really try to teach them the remaining 60%, or I can find somebody in the community that can help support them in this 60%. And that's how I make this 100% close for my kids who are more significantly challenged. I find all of a sudden now, I get people who are going to like pick up the slack for my guys, 
and are going to be able to support him. Now, I'm going to keep trying to teach because I don't want this to be stuck with this one cashier for the rest of his life. You know, but in the interim, the more people I can give the skills to, the better off he's going to be because somebody understands his particular needs. Does that make sense? Okay. We spend so much time teaching our kids that we forget that there's a whole other part of the equation. That if we spent even a little bit of time, we'd be much more successful. Which is this. Yeah, here's the neurotypical world. Here's the ASD world. This is where we start. And we don't arbitrarily say, well, you have to have this skill. We say, well, you have to have this skill because you want to be in this environment. You need to know the difference between a horse and a zebra because you're interested in zoology, not because it's part of our category training. Okay? You need to know how to cook, you know, Indian food because your family is Indian in, you know, is, is ethnically Indian and that's a big thing for you. But I'm not going to teach the kid who's ethnically Jewish to teach to do Indian food unless he really loves Indian food. Then we're going to do that. I mean, we're going to look at what the person wants and where the person needs. I've come to sort of believe that our field, since you know, the Lova study in 87, our field sort of from um, applied behavior analysis, from the age of diagnosis with kids with autism to about the age of 12, almost everything we do is geared to fight the autism. It's geared to make you as neurotypical as possible. That's what we do. I think then, you know, from the age of 12 on, it's sort of like, we work with you. I'm not working against you anymore. I'm working with you. You know, you tell me where you want to go. You tell me how we're going to get there. You know, it's a really, really bad analogy in some ways, but it's a very accurate analogy in other ways. Getting back to B.F. Skinner again, you know, he said, the rat is always right. My students are always right. They will tell me if I'm teaching the right stuff. They will tell me if I'm going in the right direction. They will give me, like even the even most nonverbal behavior involved guy can tell me whether or not he likes something. I just have to be smart enough to listen. Okay, that's the only challenge there. Second thing, we have defining characteristics of adulthood in North America. One, career choices, what we do for a living. It's the first question you ask people. What do you do? Okay? Then where do you live? What do you do with your free time? Our public social circle, our private social circle, and then our quality of life concerns. This is how we define ourselves as adults. Okay? However, if we don't look at all of this, we're not really transitioning kids to lives of competence, dignity, and quality. You know, and we focus on employment. We've gotten better at employment. We're not good at employment. I think we've gotten better at employment because it's the one um, component of adult life that's quantifiable. You can check the little box that says they're employed or not. You know, all this other stuff, this is much harder. Okay? So if we're not looking at all this stuff, we're really not helping kids have lives. And then my last thing, and I sort of said this again and again and again, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but um, we, need to teach, we need to stop teaching stuff a five-year-old can do. Okay? It's like, we teach baby stuff. We really do. You know, um, you know, because I, I do what I do, I go and I see vocational programs. Okay, so I say, oh, there's a vocational program. We're training kids to be employed. Vocation. I love the fact that like we, we have to come up with different words like for people with disabilities. Like typical kids, like you're, like vocational. It's like oh, it's a vocation. No, it's a job. You know, or he's at the job site. Unless he's working construction, there's no such thing as a job site. <laughs> job placement. Like I was never placed in my life. You know, we have, but we, have, we come up with all these, these tools. But this is sort of the typical skill set I see when I go to see quote unquote vocational programs. Or I see kids with classic autism and intellectual disabilities working on sorting, collating, labeling, stapling, filing, packaging, assembly, document shredding, envelope stuffing, and then there's usually one other wild card they throw in, right? I'll do it slower now and stop me when I hit something a five year old can't do. Sorting, collating, labeling, stapling, packaging, assembly, document shredding, envelope stuff, and you know. It's all stuff a five year old can do. And there are no jobs doing any of that stuff anyway. You know? You know how you learn to have a job? By having a job. Okay? That's how you learn to have a job. Okay? And you learn to have a desired job 
by getting fired from other jobs and learning what you liked at a job and moving through the job market and deciding what is good and what's not good. Okay, this is one area again where we've set the bar so amazingly high for folks with disability labels that it's a wonder anybody ever achieves employment in the community. When we talk about transitioning into the community though, I think we need to understand that every skill set in the community is a complex interaction of three parts. There's a social component, yes there's a production component, but there's a navigation component. Once you step outside your classrooms, all skill sets are this massive intertwined um, conglomerate of different skills. For example, this is written by Nick Palmgarten, who's an adult on the spectrum. This was published in the New Yorker in an article by Judy Hayes, Proximity to US Culture, but this is Nick's PowerPoint on how do you understand elevator behavior, okay? What are the rules for standing in an elevator? Where do people stand when there are only two or three people? What happens when a fourth person? Well, you guys know this, right? If there are only two or three people, you're sort of like, you're, you're as far away as you can, but comfortable, right? If a fourth person enters, you actually go to the corners. Okay, we put as much social distance as we can between ourselves and other people. If it becomes more crowded, what do you do? Well, now it gets really complex. Because we position ourselves where we think we're going to be away from people. If we have a bag on our shoulder, we take it off and we put it in front of us. And we hold it down in front. We sort of scrunch up a little to try and take up as little room as possible. This is a four by four room we're talking about. And look how complex it gets. How close do you stand? You don't want to touch anybody in an elevator. <laughs> okay, so you try and keep as much social distance. If you do, though, you only touch like upper arms. Okay, that's like as close as you can get. I got bored, so I put that one upside down. What do people look at in a crowded <laughs> elevator?